Ancient Rome will forever be a fascination. Rome grew from a small town on the bank of the Tiber River to a powerful empire that included large portions of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Although Rome is not quite the power it once was, there are still many inventions from ancient Rome that are in use today. Everything from newspapers to architecture and even surgical techniques began in ancient Rome and it is still a civilization that is heavily studied and learned from today. However, while the incredible inventions of ancient Rome are frequently discussed, what's not talked about so much are the personal lives of citizens during this time period. Did anyone marry for love? Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we're going to be talking about what love and marriage was like in ancient Rome. Ancient Rome was not known for equality between the sexes. The empire still valued men and their perceived needs far above women, and this was evident in the way marriages and relationships were conducted. Although there were some marriages that took place for love, the feelings of both parties generally didn't particularly matter if the union was what the fathers of the pair wanted. Not only was marriage often dictated by men, but men had a lot more freedom within the marriage to do as they pleased. While marriage in ancient Rome was expected to be monogamous, men frequently had extramarital affairs with other women and men. As long as the individuals men had intimate relationships with were not freeborn Roman citizens, nobody questioned it. And in fact, it was often expected as men were seen to be highly intimate beings who needed to be satisfied. Soliciting escorts was not taboo, and in fact, escorts often showed up in large numbers at parties and celebrations. Same intercourse relations between men were not frowned upon, and it was very common for husbands and single men to engage in intercourse with all genders. Conversely, although women did have affairs, it was not nearly as accepted, and female intercourse was always expected to be more conservative, with chastity being highly valued. In fact, there was even a group called the Vestal Virgins in Rome, a collection of women from high-born families who were selected as children to lead a life of celibacy and keep the sacred flame in the Temple of Vesta alight. These women had unique privileges, such as the right to own property and vote, but their chastity was held in such high regard that any who broke their pledge could be stoned to death or left in a closed room to die. Quite the punishment. All these decisions were made by men, as they held every position of authority. Even within individual households, men were understood to be the leader, and women were expected to respect and obey their rule. Turns out the ancient Romans were not too concerned with age, especially when it came to females. In ancient Rome, the legal age for girls to marry was just 12 years old. For boys, it was 15. But it was not uncommon for men to wait until their mid to late 20s to get married as it was thought men were not mentally balanced until the age of 26. Girls were thought to be much more mature and ready for the complexities of marriage. The idea that girls mature much faster than men begs the question, why were men in charge if they could not control their thoughts and urges until they were almost 30 years old? As already mentioned, love was not necessarily a common reason to marry. Marriages were frequently arranged between families to maintain social status and benefit each other in some way, but the marriage ceremony was not quite like we know it today. There were three different types of marriages that were recognized in ancient Rome. The first, titled Conferiatio, was what was known as a patrician marriage, or a marriage between people of nobility. At this type of ceremony, spelt cake and bread was shared. This marriage also reinforced the patriarchal structure of ancient Rome, as the bride was given by her father's hand directly to her groom. The second marriage was called coemptio, which translates to by purchase, which meant that a bride was literally sold into marriage by her own family. The final kind of marriage was probably the most likely to result out of love. It was called eusis, and was a type of marriage that came out of long-term cohabitation between partners. I'm guessing they were shacking up back then. This type of marriage was reserved for commoners. Given that it took place between nobility, it's natural that the confaratio ceremony was the most elaborate. Before the wedding, omens had to be read and the wedding could only proceed if the omens were good. The ceremony would then take place at the bride's father's house, and the room would be decorated with flowers and tapestries. A priest and ten witnesses would gather to witness the event, and the bride and groom would be joined together by a vow recited by a matron. This ceremony usually took place just before sunrise, which was symbolic of the life the couple were about to embark on together. After the ceremony, the bride and groom would sit down while the priest made an offering to Jupiter. 
and then the two of them would share spelt cake, which would signal the end of the ceremony. After a feast with their family and guests, a procession to their new place of residence would take place. As they walked, the bride would drop coins to honor the spirits of Rhodes as well as her new husband, while her husband would throw sweets into the crowd. The crowd would then throw those sweets back into the air, a tradition that now manifests as wedding guests throwing rice. Once the newlyweds reached their home, the groom would carry his new bride over the threshold and offer her water and fire as essential elements of their new home. The bride would kindle her first fire and then everyone would feast again until the night was over. The whole thing was quite a production and the celebrations lasted all day. While there was a lot that was old-fashioned about marriage in ancient Rome, attitudes about divorce sure were not. In ancient Rome, not only was divorce common, but it was also totally accepted. There was no shame in getting divorced, and in fact, remarriage was encouraged. Although this attitude did gradually change, during the ancient Rome period, there wasn't any stigma attached to the idea of divorce, which left couples free to abandon their union as long as both of them consented to it. Although in reality, it was really up to the men whether or not the marriage was over. Once a divorce was decided, the woman simply took back her dowry and left her husband's home and that was the end of it. While marriages were expected to be monogamous, we already know that many men regarded that vow quite loosely. However, there were some rules regarding intimate relations that were looked upon much more sternly if disregarded. The first was incestum, which was the violation of a family member, a freeborn Roman citizen, a vestal virgin, or any individual who had made a vow to remain chaste. You may note that this did not include non-freeborn Roman citizens, which meant violations against those individuals were common. The second was raptus, which forbade kidnapping with the express intention of intimate relations. This included women who went willingly, as they could not lawfully do so without their father's consent. The third was steptrum, which was intercourse misconduct, which included consenting extramarital affairs with freeborn Roman citizens. The last rule was casitas, which referred to women who had chosen a life of chastity, such as the Vestal Virgins, who, as mentioned, could not walk back on their vow without facing severe punishment, or in most cases, death. As a reminder, these women had their choice of chastity made for them by their families, usually when they were only five or six years old. A consistent theme here is the value of freeborn Roman citizens over anyone else. There were still many slaves in ancient Rome, and they were forced into a variety of positions including household servants, accountants, doctors, farmers, and miners. Slaves had no rights and were subject to intercourse misconduct and humiliation. Slaves were considered slaves for life, as were any descendants. While slaves were often escorts or intercourse buddies for freeborn Romans, slaves were not permitted to marry or have independent relations with nobility. This type of construct has persisted through many cultures and generations. Although some of these ideas surrounding love and marriage might seem totally archaic, they're not actually as far off as you might think. Dowries still exist in many countries, even if officially they might be illegal. Several countries still allow minors to marry with parental consent, including several U.S. states. And there are still countries where girls are forced into marriages at the insistence of her father, showing that the patriarchy is still alive and well in the tradition of marriage. While these upsetting circumstances still happen, it's heartening to know that these days many more people marry for love than they used to, and as the stigma of therapy disappears, more people turn to a talking session instead of an affair. Hopefully, the more we learn, the more we can work towards happy and long-lasting marriages. We hope you enjoyed this video, and do tell us which other civilization or period shall we cover in this series. And as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.